Min's past catches up with them, and he goes on a quest of revenge with the ton, son, Toe. And that's basically the story of Lone Wolf and Cub. Uh, we'll be talking about that and with the uh, kind of other movies that have inspired by it, the Road Perdition, and uh, more recently, the Disney Mandalorian series. I'm John Chang with uh, Dan Edmonds. Hello. <laughs> and I thought that uh, one way to kind of kick off this week's discussion would be this idea of, um, you know, like how different times you can have a, a good parody versus one that, uh, you know, like almost this kind of cliche and stuff like that. And for me, what comes to mind as a bad parody is the scary movie series where after you watch the trailers that show all the funny bits, pretty much there isn't much more to it and stuff. Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, uh, I don't know, Esther, I think though they do, they do capture a few of the, the, some of the sort of tropes in horror movies that you may not be aware of, and right. sort of put them front and center. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, they're not particularly highbrow um, <laughs> critiques of the genre, but you know, yeah. they, they do. It's funny. They, they do bring to light some stuff that you wouldn't have otherwise thought of, I think, but um, yeah, they churned them out though. Um, <laughs> I can't remember who it was, who was the main guy who made all that. Um, one of the, as a brother of somebody, right? Uh, Stand-up comedian. I can't remember that's what it's called now, but yeah. I think it's one of the one of the Williams brothers. Uh, that's it. Yeah, Damon yeah. Williams. No, yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think for me, like you know, to do a good parody, you have to kind of bring something to the um, the genre or the, or the kind of to the discussion, so to speak. And um, you know, we'll we'll kind of get to it. But uh, to me, like uh, more recently, you know, kind of the the Rick and Morty you know, YouTube video, I thought was like a, just a fantastic kind of parody of the Lone Wolf uh, and Cub series because of how like it just, um, you know, it took that series and, and kind of like brought out all the things that are kind of quirky and funny about it, but then they did it in a Rick and Morty style and stuff. And I think that's the thing that like kind of, you know, when you bring something to the conversation, that's when it's like kind of just a little bit more than just simply doing, you know, like kind of, a thing of tropes and stuff or copying tropes and everything yeah funnily enough that was the one thing i didn't watch in preparation okay. for this episode was, was the rick and morty um low movement cub unfortunately well we'll definitely have links to it for folks and uh yeah, just to check out stuff it, it just yeah after you've seen the series it's like and you watch this it's it just um you kind of just can't help but laugh normally of course rick and morty is funny but i think the way that they do parodies on stuff it's it just kind of i think they have you know like clearly uh, an appreciation for different genres and different you know kind of things and then i think you mentioned before about how it's almost nowadays when we do memes and these kind of parodies it's like that's like the the way we communicate nowadays and stuff and that's why mm -hmm. we're kind of cool and everything yeah yeah and the sort of meta level communications of memes within memes mm -hmm. yeah I think as, as, as well, the, the, they have a sort of an appreciation of the style as well of the things they're parodying. Right. You often see a sort of like um, little techniques almost that the director would have used <laughs> in the original movie being parodied in, in Rick and Morty, which is quite, which is quite good. I'm assuming then they must have had some bits in this Rick and Morty parody where it just cuts randomly to some sort of bit of nature or something just happening on the roadside <laughs> for a few seconds and then back to sort of some graphic violence, presumably. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I don't know. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Well, with that, I guess let's dive into Lone Wolf and Cub. Um, sure. We have, you know, like in some ways, a kind of very classic samurai uh, movie and stuff. Um, you get a lot of different things that kind of, to me, are insights into the Japanese culture, almost the same way as like, you know, when you have something like Once a Future King looking at um, a fictional version of, of middle uh, medieval times and stuff like that. Here you have, um, you know, basically a fictional look at, you know, medieval Japan and, you know, like kind of the whole samurai culture and tradition. And I think that's like, kind of, to me, like one of the things that really stands out about it is just like that in itself, um, it's, you know, like certainly with the kind of uh, stylized violence and stuff, it, it's got its own kind of, um, you know, the things that like, we're, as we talked about, are, are kind of parodied and stuff but um to me like it, it's just different times like the way that they use uh you know lies to tell the truth as we kind of say um it, it's just a great look at kind of a unique time in uh, japan's history 
Yeah, I, th I think what it really does give you is a, a view into the extremes of what that society would have been like in that, you know, the, the inequalities between the different classes, the, um, the, the sort of standards of living of, of people at, the, at one end and, the other, and likewise at the other end, the, um, you know, the, the seppuku uh, thing when Harry Kiri, all these sort of things are sort of dealt with a number of times in it and how the sort of honor between the, the arrangement of the various clans with the Shogun would have had to have been on, you know, upheld and what that would have meant and losing face and how, how that is more important than, than people's lives a lot of the time, any individual lives, mm. you know, the, the, the honor of the, of the particular clan is held, you know, to a higher level than any individual person's life. Right. Unless of course they tend to be the old guy in charge, in <laughs> which case, but yeah. So, I mean, and all of that stuff is really interesting. Yeah. It, it's funny. Like you said that, um, you know, it, it's almost as if the, this kind of ritualized killing is reserved for these upper classes and stuff, because mm -hmm. if you're a peasant, you know, like kind of, you're just basically cut down, um, just, you know, like kind of without thought and stuff. And this is something we've talked about in other episodes and other ways of, you know, that, like in some ways, um, you know, the, the whole idea again about us versus them, in this case, you know, the upper class is the, you know, us and, and we're kind of um, brought into this world through the story, but otherwise like kind of, you know, the them, the kind of peasants stuff, you know, their, their story is not even really kind of considered significant enough or important enough to be told and stuff. And, and that's what I think is interesting about kind of, the whole genre too that like um we see um and, and you know it really it's a reflection about you know universally in different cultures that like um you know when um in, in some ways even like modern society right where um the stories that fascinate us are the stories about the you know the rich and wealthy you know like kind of there's even that one series right the lifestyles of the rich and famous and stuff absolutely yeah yeah yeah, there's very few reality shows on lives of the homeless people living in, in the end of the street or something like this. It's, yeah, and, and I mean, you know, a lot of the, and he's, I think what's good about this is you see um, by adopting the demon way in hell, mm. it gives him a car, it gives uh, Ito Ogami uh, um, an opportunity to interact with people who he wouldn't normally interact with if he That's was true. the Shogun executioner. So he can take a sort of a moral view outside of the the present society and probably out of that time a little bit mm -hmm. to sort of reflect on, you know, what, what should have been the right thing to do. So there's lots, you know, there's women sold into prostitution and slavery and mm -hmm. he often sort of is the one to sort of uphold, you know, protect them. Yeah. And this is kind of reminds me of like kind of some Westerns where you have that hired gun person who, um you know maybe somehow has a fall from grace like they may have been a soldier or um something that was kind of more respectable in ways and stuff like that but then because of like something that happens that then he ends up being more accessible like you said to the common people and because then he's like kind of you know like like um the local peasants need somebody to kind of you know right a wrong and stuff like that or to defend them from some rogue samurai or something like that and it's interesting how um, that's something that like we see even in like kind of, you know, the, the Westerns and, and, you know, again, that kind of story of like kind of some lone wolf, um, which is repeated, you know, many times in many ways. Well, I think True Grit is the obvious um, oh, right. um, one there because we've got someone who sort of works outside the law, but he has his own sense of honor and justice that, that is sort of played out in, in the movie. Um, so I kind of feel that that's somewhat similar in this one. It's, um, he's, yeah, he's the Lone Ranger making up his own code as he goes of where he sees mm. fit. And, and the fact that he's decided to sort of go this path of not really caring about whether he loses face or anything else. It's just down to his individual honor mm. as, you know, as, as, as him rather than his ties to the rest of society. And that's gotta be a fantasy for Japanese, um, people also because of the fact that like for the most part you're always considered part of the greater whole and stuff that's very much a key part of their culture and you know here we have a lone wolf and, and that's something that's you know uh, another reason why we see that in you know very popularized in, in america 
culture and with Westerns and stuff is because that's kind of like the symbol of like kind of, you know, um, you know, quote unquote, being American, right, is to be this kind of, um, you know, individual and where you kind of um, are self-reliant and uh, you don't need anybody else, anybody else and stuff. Whereas in Japanese society, um, you know, even if you are a peasant and stuff, the reason why you're there is because you're existing as part of this bigger social fabric and where your place is to be part of that. And, um, you know, just this idea of, of being a, you know, kind of rugged individual is very much a fantasy, I think. Mm, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly in the, no, of course, as usual, spoiler alert, I mean, <laughs> for the good of the clan, it seems every family child, mm. legitimate or illegitimate, has to go up and sort of try and uh, go into death matches with Ito <laughs> in order to uphold the, the Yagyu clan. So everyone is disposable very much. I mean, obviously yeah. there's hundreds of foot soldiers that all get sort of chopped down in between um, as are peasants who are, you know, either cannon fodder or, um, you know, people who might sort of talk about it so get cut down in some point or another. So yeah, it's uh, definitely a big disparity in who's disposable and who isn't in, in uh, the pecking order. And I think this kind of um, idea that you're talking about, about, you know, kind of being, people being disposable until you get to the kind of this um, quote unquote big boss and everything. It's funny how that's something that we see often in video games. Like kind of, yeah. you know, like, you know, just, it's, it's just now like something that is ingrained into like kind of, you know, like when you go to a game different times, you, you pretty much expect that trope, if you will, to be, you know, kind of, it's like very much almost like, um, you know, talk about remakes, you know, like kind of the, these video games, like I, copy this again and again yeah i mean it's it is interesting because definitely the the you know it's almost like anonymous hordes that you have to like cut through and then you get the boss right. character who's sort of bigger better armored than the rest and yeah. although it's interesting that the the boss battle has become like one of the things that's become the main draw of video games over time mm -hmm. i think especially with japanese video games mm -hmm. like you saw what what tends to ha what tended to happen over time is that the bits of mowing down the hordes got shorter and shorter and the strategy mm. and the complexity of the boss mm. battles got longer yeah. until you've almost got like the metal gear solid titles are almost like you know one long boss battle then a sort mm. of cinematic sequence a few little bits and pieces and then another long boss battle and with with less and less of the kind of stealth or getting through the 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 uh henchmen in between so right yeah i'm trying to remember there was there was one that, um one of my favorite ones is warning forever which is a, a video mm. game which which is just boss battles over and over again wow. you just go from one boss one to the next one they just get complexity you know um increasingly harder and it's called warning forever because you know there's this thing of like warning just flashes across the screen as mm -hmm. the boss approaches so it's just that like you see that a hell of a lot when you're playing <laughs> But yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it makes you wonder, you know, is this kind of like a part of Japanese society, which is now being kind of like hard coded into hundreds of video mm. games. Seeing yeah. as most of them are born from, you know, in Japan. So I think it's also a statement of how different times it's interesting how, um, you know, these movies right were from the seventies way before video games ever became popular and stuff. And I think that, um, that storytelling became so ingrained that then, you know, when it came time to make these games, I think it was just a natural part, a natural extension of, you know, what, you know, the, um, the things that I think the, you know, the filmmakers, the storytellers kind of grew up, you know, probably consuming as kids and stuff. Yeah. And I mean, I would say Lone Wolf and Cub is almost structured like a video game in <laughs> Each Definitely. one of the movies, you, he's killing another one of the Yagyu clan yep. kids until he gets the boss at the end. You know, it's, um, yeah, it's a, definitely a story of progression in some, you know, in that respect. And any um, kind of other insights into Japanese culture that kind of maybe caught you by surprise or like kind of um, that you didn't really um, expect? Yeah, maybe. Okay, well, maybe not. Uh, I guess I suppose it is Japanese culture and the movie, but I mean, the fact that it starts with Ogami murdering, well, killing, executing a five-year-old kid, it sets mm. a pretty high yeah. bar of 
how much you're going to have to work at to like this character because I mean right. he is he is pretty a, a pretty reprehensible character right from the get go. Mm. Um, but it just but I think they again they've used this extremity of like that was such a revered position and he right. was held in such high esteem. But the day to day was that he was killing kids and people who were you know psychologically unhinged who happened to be in power at the time. But yeah, it was still like a you know a very um, noble position. Yeah, I, th I think that's definitely one key part of like kind of you know probably Eastern culture where um, it, it's it's more this idea that honor like kind of supersedes everything else. So yeah. um, and, and I think maybe as time's gone on, you know, it, it's almost in some ways become less of a thing. But um, definitely like. Yeah, you know, I'd say like kind of, you know, the, the combination of like ritual suicide or, um, you know, like just these different things kind of related to honor has, mm. has definitely been a bigger part of, you know, the Eastern culture. And when I say Eastern culture, I'm talking about how it's, it's you know, definitely um, part of the DNA, not just of Japanese society, but I would say, you know, even, you know, like I grew up, you know, with this idea of, you know, being raised in a Chinese family that, um, you know, to bring shame to you your family is like kind of, you know, or to, you know, yeah, to your family or to, um, to your people, stuff like that is much, you know, worse than death and stuff. So, so in other words, death is like the least of your worries if, if you yeah, do something absolutely. shameful and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think of all the different sort of permutations of, uh, say honor killing in, in, um, Indian and, uh, Pakistani cultures and things like this. It's, uh, yeah. It's, Similar, similar sort of things there, in terms of the family um, honor is held up uh, much higher than any sort of individual one, or is it's you know the the it's for the, the good of the community and the and the family. Yeah, and um, I I thought that uh, you know the, of course the other thing that kind of makes this kind of um, the story is is the cub right stuff. So you have this kind of cute kid who he has to basically. Um, you know, it, granted, it's, it's his own child, stuff like that. But um, it, it's it's sometimes um, you know, besides like kind of that jarring introduction and stuff to Lone Wolf, it, it's also interesting how different times, like you know, all these kind of horrible things are happening around him. But meanwhile, there's this kid who's like kind of you know, this cute kid that's kind of just sitting there, um, you know, kind of basically seeing all this happening and stuff, like you know, everything from of course the killings and stuff to like you know, rape and. It's it's um in some ways I guess the violence is kind of you know I, I kind of jokingly call it like kind of Mont, Monty Python esque uh, in terms of yeah. just this this spewing of blood everywhere and stuff. But meanwhile, you know, like, this kid kind of just you know very innocently is kind of just you know like looking around and and observing all this stuff happening. Well, I think that's actually the really the the most compelling thing about Lone Wolf and Cub mm. is this idea that you have you know a kid that can barely even talk. Mm -hmm. um the, you know the epitome of innocence is being sort of thrown into this world of sort of right. rape and you know murder and mayhem and there's no and i think for me one of the most powerful scenes is the one where you know he gives the the boy the choice of the ball or the sword mm. and says you know you don't understand my words but destiny will just sort of drive you to whichever one right and, you know uh and he crawls towards the sword you know and yeah. and i think that's kind of this thing at that point, um, he has to make this decision that essentially whatever happens, he will just try and do his best mm. for his son and his bond with, I think that's really the, the, the key message is that the bond between the father and the son is what kind of will keep, um, Daigoro from becoming a complete psychopath and traumatized by this whole oh. event. As long as there's the kind of, um, the, the steady influence of the father as a, as a kind of a pillar of strength, mm. then, you know, it, it's kind of like a quite an, op in some ways, I would say a kind of an optimistic view on it saying that, you know, a strong family bond will keep, will, will get you through all these horrific things. If you, if you choose to sort of unapologetically accept that way of life. Yeah, I think it's that. And also I thought it was interesting how there was one, um, and we'll kind of get to it, you know, shortly stuff in, Sh in Shogun Assassin. Um, I, I didn't see it in the the um, the Lone Wolf series because I only watched the first movie, Sword of Vengeance. But um, there's this one part where 
uh, one of the ninja assassins kind of basically says that the child is the, his source of power and stuff. And so once mm -hmm. we get the child away from him, um, you know, he'll be, you know, quote unquote, um, vulnerable to us and stuff. And so I think, like you said, other than kind of, you know, this grounding effect, um, I think it also gives him a reason to kind of keep going, you know, like, in, in other words, I think a um, quest of vengeance, um, you know, once it's done, then then why will he kind of continue himself? And, and then and then also, I think, um, having that motivation of like kind of you know that he's also protecting the child i think is like a stronger stronger reason than, than just vengeance to kind of keep going and stuff yeah yeah and that's a very interesting because i i mean i absolutely loved all of these lone wolf and cub movies <laughs> the first time i've actually watched them i watched all six because i thought they were brilliant um and that's a very interesting interpretation of that because it doesn't looking at the subtitles it didn't really it was just like oh that's oh, his okay. weak spot let's go and do it it's not like Right. They didn't, you know, twist it as like a, that's a source of his kind of power or his motivation, which was a, uh, yeah, interesting way of doing Yeah, that. I mean, that, that might have been very well the English dubbing too. So, um, mm. so that's what's interesting about Children's Assassin, which I guess we might as well start talking about that. Children's yeah. Assassin is um, an American production, apparently, and uh, they basically took the Japanese series and then basically dubbed in English, um, you know, over everything, which has its pros and cons with any of these kind of uh, movies of uh, dubbing and stuff. Um, certainly we can see different times like the less uh, stellar uh, voiceover kind of quality and stuff, which is kind of like the, the stereotypical bad uh, voiceovers and, and kung fu movies and the, that we saw uh, so much in the 70s and you know, early 80s and stuff. Um, so there's that aspect. But then also I think sometimes uh, things can be, you know, lost in the translation can be like kind of a... Um, in a very much American slash um, uh, poetic license interpretation of, of what's happening and stuff. Yeah, and I think as well, and it's probably a good time to talk about Jizza's uh, album, uh, Liquid Swords, from Please. the Wu-Tang Clan, because <laughs> that uses samples from Shogun Assassin all the way through. And um, I think it's Fourth Chamber has mm. the, the quote where he's talking about the ball and the sword. And um, yeah, there's a lot of it. And, and it's funny, it's sort of, in some respects, a long time that the sort of, the overdubbed voices were seen as sort of laughable because they're out of mm -hmm. time and stuff. But in a weird sort of way, um, a lot of Riz's production is he takes a lot of those sound bites and gives them a real reverence in a way. It, it's, it's almost like you're, you're, he is giving his own kind of poetic spin on some of these dubbed mm -hmm. um, things and, and in, imbues them with a kind of spirituality almost through through uh, the way they're used in the tracks. Interesting. Um, and, and I think it's, you know, the fact that they almost built an entire subculture, I think mostly built around Shogun Assassin mm -hmm. and a few others, but um, Shogun Assassin was, I mean, you know, that and probably I'm guessing Lone Wolf and Cub had a big influence on a lot of those mm. albums and things, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, re really interesting to hear all those clips in their original form. <laughs> after you know hearing them back in the 90s and things. right and of course a classic album if anyone wants to you know if you want to hear uh, you know i'm really not a fan of modern day hip-hop but if you want to hear a classic go and go and get liquid swords by jizz because that's a really uh, interesting sword play as they like to call it <laughs> which is anyway go into that another time but yeah um obviously very influential influential on quentin tarantino and right. um, Frank Miller and various other people as well. Uh, I think. Yeah, I think it's it's one of those like things that uh, if if you are, you know, pretty much anywhere from that time period, you had to have at, at some point seen like a bunch of different, you know, these martial arts movies and stuff. I think that what's interesting also is that like I felt like the the Japanese um, ones weren't as as accessible. It was really almost impossible, other than the Criterion. Yeah. Uh, you know, movies to find that in, in um, you know, your local video store and stuff. And it's now, of course, more much more accessible with the internet and like kind of just the many different ways we kind of can catch things and stuff. So I think that's also a interesting kind of progression, I guess, over the years. Well, I think the main, the main difference with the, you know, the, the, this is a Japanese samurai movie. It was almost like a horror movie. You know, mm. it's, it's that gory and stuff. You know, most mm. of the, I would say most of the, sort of the Chinese martial arts movies at that time were shows of acrobatics and skill mm. and, and 
you know, obviously storytelling, but I mean, this is very much more kind of brutal, quick battles, very realistic, but mm. well, not very realistic. Um, <laughs> I, only in terms of how the, how the fights would have played out, not in terms of <laughs> what they would have visually looked like, because that's another thing. I mean, the, the whole, I mean, that is almost a, a meme in itself is the, the blood splatter. Right. from the spraying of blood from arteries <laughs> being cut by samurai swords is uh you know that's a whole thing in itself quentin tarantino seemed bound to write you know two movies purely based on that effect it seems almost but yeah i think um another iconic uh, series um for me was shogun itself um you know with the mm -hmm. based on the james clavell novel and stuff and i've I think that like for a lot of folks, it was just kind of like a, a glimpse into this other world that like, you know, um, it, it just was totally foreign. And then I think after that, you know, like there was more interest and more awareness about, you know, like kind of, you know, the Japanese culture, the traditional Japanese culture and stuff. And it's, you know, funny enough that like around the eighties, of course, um, they were pretty much the, the bank, if you will, uh, for a lot of different things. The, um, you know, we certainly heard a lot more about like kind of, you know, uh, things like sushi, like there's a lot, just a lot more things that were introduced into popular mainstream culture from the East, from Japan. And I think a lot of it had to do just certainly with um, their rise and like kind of stature around that time and stuff because of, you know, financially and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, I was reading that apparently the original manga writer, um, I can't remember his first name, but Kasuki, mm -hmm. I guess his last name, but, um, you know, he wrote um, Lone Wolf and Cub because he was afraid of the deterioration of family values. Hmm. And so I think he, that was, a, you know, he had this sort of strong bond between the father and son. But I mm -hmm. think the idea of contrasting it with all of this extreme violence, because it is really extreme, a lot of the yeah. stuff, and the extreme immorality is to sort of show, you know, this, this kind of contrast. I may be in Japanese culture at that time and that you had you know zen buddhism meditation as this stillness and silence and sort of perfect peace and tranquility right. that was interrupted by you know people hacking each other to pieces <laughs> with samurai swords and that and that is kind of you know you see that in um kenji masumi's directed movies mm. not so much in the ones that aren't directed by him like the last one and number four but um the ones he does you know it, it'll have these sort of just very random bits of just filming nature and then mm -hmm. it's straight back into the action and mm -hmm. it's used very much like the same contrast if you got of ito being the killing machine and his mm -hmm. son being this kind of you know just a, a sort of a ball of innocence being thrown into it all the same goes with the sort of the way the movies are made as well i think i tried to right. represent that i think yeah i mean it's definitely um one of those things that uh makes it um it, it gives it a very unique kind of style that like, even like, even if you watch um, any Akira Kurosawa movies with uh, Samurai, he's a lot more focused on the action. He's a lot more focused on like kind of, you know, the, the plot moving forward and stuff. And there isn't like, like you said, these kind of pauses as much. Like you re rarely, I don't think, I can't think of any footage of uh, you know, like se so something like Seven Samurai, uh, which of course uh, will definitely be one of those series we'll be covering as well and stuff. Um, yeah that that he's wasting on you know quote unquote wasting on like kind of you know a, a moment of stuff like i mean certainly um there's a cinematic quality to akira karasawa but um but i think he's very much like concerned about like kind of keeping things going and, and that like every shot is kind of about something that he wants to reflect in the story or um you know like kind of some something kind of going on with the plot and stuff it, it's less about like kind of like you said a kind of plaintive kind of um shots yeah and I, and I think that's what actually is kind of nice about these because you do get these pauses where you can tell that uh i think kenji masumi really wants to sort of put you in the position of what life would be like at that mm. time so you know there's bits where there's you know, people you know you go and the daigoro goes and spends time with the candy seller or the people who are doing the puppeteering and and it really gives a lot of sort of realism and and mm. to I mean, it's it's funny because it's a real kind of uh, mm -hmm. real contrast and then because there's some bits feel very kind of everyday life, what it would have been like to have mm -hmm. lived in that period. And especially just the the way people are dressed and what they're wearing. Some right. of it's completely bizarre, but mm -hmm. it may, I'm assuming it was very um, realistic to what mm -hmm. would have been worn at the time. And then you have like, you know, <laughs> 
arteries sp spraying everywhere so, uh, with sort of tomato ketchup colored blood and, and it's it's a real sort of interesting um you know uh, contrast of styles right i think yeah. that's what maybe it makes it sit in people's heads so much afterwards it's very you know it's a real kind of extreme experience definitely i think yeah i, I think that's a great um you know point just like basically how like you said there's, there's these kind of moments of um you know quiet punctuated by these you know striking you know <laughs> like special effects uh, explosions and stuff <laughs> and and yeah. you just yeah like you said you just can't get around that you just um there I, I i can't think of anything else other than again like kind of you know like where monty python like basically um is a comedy and so it's done for comedic effect and here like it's done with this kind of like um I don't know about seriousness, but it, it's just basically, it just feels like a natural part of like kind of this series of stuff. Like where um, I, I kind of find myself laughing at times because of like where it's just this kind of, um, I don't know, the, the reaction to kind of just the, how um, it, it just seems like so, you know, insane, like kind of so like, uh, you know. Yeah, like, but I, but but I think that that actually that sort of level of extreme violence mm -hmm. and comedy in in Japanese film is is pretty intertwined. Mm. Um, I mean, I, a friend of mine he had a good buddy who was, who was Japanese, and we were talking about B. Takeshi's movies, which you've ever seen them. Mm. There's it has it has again it has some sort of quite quirky bits punctuated mm -hmm. by some very extreme violence. And we were talking about Violent Cop, which has this one scene where he's interrogating someone mm -hmm. and he's just repeatedly slapping this guy around the face. <laughs> he slaps him in the face like 30 times in this scene. And when the first couple of times you think, oh, okay. And then you think, wow, he's still slapping him. And then you suddenly think, <laughs> God, this poor actor. Um, but, you know, you have to remember, B. Takeshi was also the guy who did uh, Takeshi's Castle, which is, mm -hmm. you know, the really painful to watch uh, physical... Um, obstacle course tv show i'm sure right. people are like familiar with those kind of things mm -hmm. and um so this idea of like you know real pain being inflicted for the for comedic <laughs> effect i think right. is something that's very sort of ingrained and i mean talking to him about it I, I was talking about i don't know what movie it was we were talking about something that was much more extreme and much more violent and he was just like going yeah well it's just it's just hilarious that's why we like it so much <laughs> now i could just be him i don't want to sort of generalize about right. all, you know japanese culture because i'm certainly not in a position to make that cool but his take on it was that you know this is actually like we all know it's there for comedic effect basically right. yeah i mean sometimes when you watch like even uh, like you said these modern game shows and stuff um there's this kind of like it, it's it's goes beyond even like kind of Las Vegas style kind of like just overload of your senses and stuff. It just kind of really, um, it, it's something else, I guess. And something that probably for Western culture, uh, like we, we look at it and go, you know, you just almost don't get a headache just from like the minute you kind of like watch more than a few seconds of it. But yet it's, I don't know, it's something that, that really is a striking contrast to how we tend to think of like kind of you know uh, never mind Japanese culture but even um, Asian society as very very calm very you know sedate and stuff and it's almost like I think maybe that's partially what it is like where you have like kind of this control by day and stuff but then at night on this television set you turn on this kind of you know bizarre world kind of chaos yeah. and stuff. I mean yeah I mean absolutely it's it's like the the, the inner world of chaos is expressed mm. through the especially through I mean you know anime and manga is, mm. is complete because uh, that right. you have license to do absolutely anything yeah and you know you just have to look at hentai or something like fist of the north star which is where you know most sort of I don't know if you ever watched that but yeah. it's kind of like uh, it's set in a post apocalyptic world where people have mm. you know these sort of enormous guys fight each other with extreme martial arts and they do it so extremely that people's heads explode like they do this sort of you know 10 finger technique and then their head explodes and stuff it, it was it was the most extreme thing i'd ever seen when it came out and i was like what the god's name is going on here but um yeah i mean that is that is kind of like that's definitely part part of the culture it's yeah i, I think it's something like we're um to, to i guess a simpler idea for me about it is like that different times, um, I think people need outlets. Like kind of, you know, like yeah. when, you, when you have a very much a controlled society, but um, human nature is what it is that like different times we have, 
a combination of rage and all that. You know, I, I think, you know, um, people look at kind of um, the U.S. society and kind of, you know, the things of like road rage and that kind of idea that, um, and, and they shake their heads and kind of, you know, uh, you know, go, you know, what the F and stuff. And I think um, the thing is, though, that like with some of these other cultures uh, where for Americans, it's hard to understand how like, you know, in anime or, you know, anti, they can have that kind of violence and stuff. I feel like maybe for them, that's the outlet kind of, you know, to basically absorb it and like kind of, you know, these uh, media that, you know, like kind of in the end, it's, you know, like kind of, it's, it's extremely violent, but it's not harming anybody. It's like, kind of, it, whereas yeah. um, American society tends to criticize, <clears throat> excuse me, movies and video games as causing kind of, um, causing kids to be violent and stuff. And, and they kind of criticize that like that's the cause and stuff and and I feel like you know it, it's it's not necessarily um, the consumption that kind of creates it it's I think the I don't know that like somehow if you don't um, find a way to uh, a, a more uh, healthy outlet if you will for that kind of rage or whatever else you're it's it's going to come out in some different ways i guess well, yeah I, I think that's the, the real thing is finding the healthy outlet because yeah. unfortunately with video games like something like call of duty you've got something that's pressing people's you know you're pointing a gun first person at other people shooting mm. them and it's hitting dopamine receptors rewarding you going hey keep playing keep playing this is right. you know this is great and you know and you're in living in a country <laughs> where you can easily get hold of guns and <laughs> You know, and there's not much sort of psychological support for people. This is almost like a, a recipe for disaster. But um, I mean, as interesting as well, it's some pent up rage. I do think there's this kind of thing of culture, a cultural sort of psychological um, uh, trauma in a way. And mm. I've heard other people speaking about this. And you've got to remember, the Japanese got nuked twice. So mm. that I think that has to that that must be at some level in the subconscious definitely ingrained into that that mentality sure. in it um and it's you know you only have to watch a number of anime to see you know a lot of them are about massive explosions in the end of the world mm. and things like this it's um right. it's it's i think it's you know we use all these things as a sort of a kind um like a catharsis or be it sort of cultural or or psychological to some degree yeah well i, th I think uh speaking of kind of you know catharsis uh um, I think it's a good time to transition to road perdition and stuff. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. In the, um, the original Lone Wolf, we don't see as much the devastation to the family as we do in this one, where, um, mm. you know, Tom Hanks, of course, plays the father, and he's, you know, like kind of like, you know, whereas the, um, they spent some time in the Lone Wolf series of kind of showing him coming home to his wife and stuff like that, but in the um, the, the Road to Perdition, we really see like kind of just you know like the, the um, here's this you know um, quote unquote executioner for the mob that um, he really sees like kind of things coming to roost as to um, his own you know like like. Um, the phrase that comes to mind is, is this idea that, um, you know, never mind violence begins violence and stuff, but um, just that very much this, um, where we see kind of in, in some ways like karma coming around where now um, seeing his own family kind of, you know, being slaughtered and stuff like that, it just kind of really um, drives home to the point that like, you know, hey, you've been doing this kind of stuff all this time and everything, but, yeah. you, you know, like meanwhile, you're living this kind of, you know, nice family life and stuff like that. Well, here's a little dose of that yourself. Yeah, well, I don't think there's a single gangster movie where anyone comes out of mm. it with a, with a loving family and a happy ever after where everyone's right. is in, living in the suburbs. It's like, it's always the main point of any gangster movie. It's like, you know, what you do comes back to you and to get you in some degree, mm. you know, you, you can never really escape that world. Um, and it's, it's funny because, you know, the, um, the author of that, whose name is escaping me, I'm going to say Max Allen something Collins. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he, he, he cites Lone Wolf and Cub as an as a influence on him. But I mean, I think he did make quite a few um, 
significant changes or twists. Oh, yeah. I mean, the fact that you've, with with um in in terms of the sort of family connection with Lone Wolf and Cub, you wonder like what will normal life be for this kid, whereas with Road to Perdition they have a normal life which gets mm. lost, you know. Mm. So um, you know that, that's definitely one of the, one of the differences, of course, and and it completely loses all of the cultural aspects of of the honor system. Sure. You know, it, everyone is a criminal basically in Road to Perdition. Yeah. And okay, there's loyalty, but mm, it's not a you know, it's not enough to kind of tie you to a higher sort of uh, moral or behavioral code as it would in in uh, Lone Wolf and Cub. Well, that's I think what's I find fascinating is that um, we see this like kind of you know, never mind the Godfather series or the Sopranos and stuff, um, you know, or even like you know, like Dexter or stuff. You have these like you know, psychopaths, right, that, like, still adhere to a code that, like, um, you know, that, like, despite all things that, like, um, you know, in terms of their, you know, how, what they do as a criminal, stuff like that, but the thing that still bonds them or provides some kind of structure organization is having this code, like, kind of, you know, and, you know, like, for the mob and stuff, it's, it's kind of like um, this secret handshake kind of thing and stuff, um, but it's interesting to me that, um, you know, even though, like we say, like, you know, there's no honor among thieves, but mm. yet, you know, in each case, they still, you know, like kind of have to have some kind of code to not have total chaos and stuff. But I think also it's kind of the trope of gangster movies in that they mm. have their codes and their loyalties and then the, the interplay between the families that there's always like the one loose cannon. Who doesn't right. who doesn't obey the rules. And this one is Daniel Craig's, you know, Connor, <laughs> who kind of just goes out of the um you know outside of the rules of everything um yeah there's nearly and it's like joe pesci in um i want to say like casino or something like that he mm. was sort of but um i mean it goes back to actually our, our talk on um red dragon um mm. in that why do even psych psychopaths set up their own rules why do they set up these kind of rule systems for themselves or rituals with the killings you know right and i kind of i think it comes back to this fundamental thing of of what we we're talking about where you know savagery and um you know it's a savage act killing killing another person but why have any rules around it at all i think it's because even in something even if that you've made that as part of your identity you still need to provide meaning and a code mm. to your life and that's why i think psychopaths have these kind of these rituals because otherwise you are just a, a total animal mm. Anyway, I, that's, that's I, I, I mean, for, for me, what's interesting is uh, um, the insight that, um, you know, I, I referred to it some different times of, uh, you know, with uh, the one book on Confessions of a Sociopath, that um, the author talks about how even sociopaths need kind of the container of rules. And, and um, mm. in other words, you know, here's a, these, these people that are pretty amoral because of the fact that, like, they don't have empathy you know, so they lack that ability to feel enough guilt to not do something. So the only thing that kind of reins them in is having rules and, and laws and stuff. And so having a code, like, you know, um, in this case, uh, the one that really is, is striking for me is in Dexter that um, he has this thing called Harry's Code. And so mm, yeah. it, was, it was only by the fact that, like, his father recognized the need to kind of create this kind of artificial... Um, you know, rules, which, you know, like, it's just as artificial as any of these other kind of mob kind of secret handshakes and stuff, but it's, it's that which provides, like, kind of, you know, some structure, some kind of, you know, um, it's almost like, um, to me, you know, when we talk about artificial intelligence, that, like, it's a kind of a prime directive, if you will, that, like, you know, don't do this yeah. if this happens and stuff. Yeah, 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 which, of course, is, we all know is, from other sci-fi movies going <laughs> went really badly. Um, right, right. And, and I mean, speaking of, you know, psychopaths, we've got, we've got a, you know, a couple of English psychopaths in this movie. Mm. You know, we've got Daniel Craig on one side being actually very good, I would say. I was very good as the, as the role of Connor. He's, mm. he's very menacing and, um, yeah, very believable. I, I, I really enjoyed his performance in Road to Perdition. And Jude Law playing a really, oh, right. um, yeah, being a very good sort of psychopath as well. And interestingly, another connection back to Red Dragon, we've got a psycho who's interested in photography again. Yeah. So in this and in trophy keeping, you know, it, it's right. It has a very sort of contemporary kind of feel as as a character. Um, 
and it's I think it was interesting as well. They made, they had the the detail that he's obviously um, got a sweet tooth and his teeth are rotting because he likes so much sugar and everything. And, mm. and it's almost like, you know, he's got a, a obsession, you know, a kind of, kind of lack of self-control, I think is mm. what that's alluding to. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's a great point, that that's, um, you know, a, a almost like kind of, you know, signed, if you want, like, you know, not, not to say that, like, uh, if, you, if you see somebody rotting teeth, they're necessarily a psycho and stuff. But at yeah, the same yeah. time, though, um, I, I think it's, it's interesting, like you said, a, a small detail that, like, provides like um you know almost like volumes like kind of of, of uh, insight into the fact that like you said that here's somebody with with really little self-control and um and and it's just that that like uh except for the fact that like in this case um probably just the money and just kind of how he has to oblige by the terms of a contract that he's hired under and stuff like that is like his structure and everything but other than that mm -hmm you know, anything goes as far as oh, like, yeah. how to achieve that and stuff. Because he just is relentless, like, like, a, like a Terminator and stuff. Yeah, totally, yeah. No, I, I thought the way they portrayed his character was excellent. The way mm. he's just, you know, just a sort of a random killing machine. Jude Law does a great, great job with that role, I think. Yeah. And the way they portrayed that, his lack of regard for the rules of society was, was really well done. And, and I think, and I think sort of, um, Clearly, Daniel Craig's psychological profile as Connor is one who's a, a narcissist because he's, you mm. know, he's completely driven by his ego. He's going to inherit his father's um, uh, business. Mm. You know, he's, he's after he's killed the wife and the son, he's more in, he's interested in his appearance. He's looking in the mirror like after he's killed them and um, just basically anything out for his own self-interest. And I think, you know, like the other thing that kind of, you know, ties it to back to the original Lone Wolf is this idea of, um, you know, father, fatherhood and father, father, son. Um, yeah. And we almost have like a mirror, right, of where on the one hand, um, there's this kind of innocence with, you know, Tom Hanks and his child, um, Michael and stuff. And whereas, you know, um, Daniel Craig, um, you know, is the son of a gangster, you know, kind of played by Paul Newman in this case. And, um, you know, besides like not having the innocence and stuff, um, he's, you know, like kind of just more than even corrupt and everything. He, he's like very much, uh, like you said, you know, just like kind of primed for his role to step in. And, um, and if anything, that fuels it to where he, he's like kind of, you know, like, um, in fact, that's kind of a little bit of what drove, drives the story in this case, where he's just a little too eager. And because of that, he's starting to kind of, you know, um, you know, steal money on the side and then ends up killing, you know, like doing this killing that kind of triggers the chain of events that really happens and stuff, you know, major, major story alert. And, yeah. um, and I think um, that kind of is echoed a little bit in Lone Wolf. We, it's not a huge story in it, but um, there's a one part, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the, the son of the, uh, the, the leader of the clan and stuff, but he's also, you know, like early on is like kind of, um, trying to, you know, make his mark and stuff and, and kind of, you know, and because of that, he ends up getting killed. Um, so that's mm. one thing that is reflected in both stories and stuff. Um, but in, in also what's in interesting in both cases, though, is that the father um, feels like kind of this, it, it's more the duty. It's like kind of that, that, that um, I think it's a statement about fatherhood at different times, you know, your son is your son and, you know, you, you are kind of um, almost tied to this need to kind of protect them from themselves even. Well, yeah, I mean, Paul Newman delivers a soundbite, I think, in about the first half an hour. <laughs> for the tradition, we're just like, ah, sons are sent to trouble their fathers. Mm. And just like that could almost be the tagline underneath Road to Perdition. Right. But, um, and I mean, you know, uh, that's actually a key difference as well, I think, with Lone, with Lone Wolf is, is mm. like you said, this mirroring of the, the elements of, father and son relationship and mm. the effects they can have um, and Paul Newman does a great job um, of playing someone who can be sort of amiable and somewhat a sort of a pillar of the community mm -hmm. but also like this kind of quite brutal right. person I, I love the way he does whenever he's faced with a decision of who to kill and and like you know he's there going oh lord protect me lord protect me 
And I go, oh, Lord, what shall I do? And then I go, do you want to kill the kid too? And say, oh, Lord, oh, dear, oh, no. And it's like, yeah, it's clearly like this facade of being like vaguely religious and all of these things, but ruling with an iron fist is, is really, really nicely done, I think. Yeah, I mean, that's one of those things that uh, we see in these kind of gangster movies, right, where I, I don't know if like in, in the, um, you know, the earlier times that that was as reflected, but certainly the Godfather series, um, you know, like where it's one of those iconic scenes where Michael is there with the son's baptism. Meanwhile, this brutal execution is happening. So it's like kind of this, um, I, to say that it's hypocritical is like kind of an understatement. I feel like it's like kind of this weird thing that like, um, these gangsters live in both worlds you know like kind of on the one hand they want to like still ascend to heaven and stuff but meanwhile there are these things that like they're doing that there's just no way they're going to ever make it you know to the pearly gates yeah it's church on sunday raise hell on monday mm -hmm. <laughs> you know yeah and i mean it's and i think as well it's this this key thing of the gangster thing and most of at least it's portrayed in the movies is that you know it's often the kids who are orphans who don't have parents who are sort of brought in hmm. and exploited with this kind of family structure right, and then right. sort of manipulated to, to kind of do these things so it's um yeah that's that's virtually in i can't think of a single gangster movie where they don't have some <laughs> element of that actually but no. Yeah, like uh, as a side note, like uh, if, if you ever watch the Boardwalk Empire series, that's like a key element of that series and stuff, because what you just said and stuff, like that um, the, the gangs, um, you know, provide this kind of artificial structure for, you know, impressionable use, so to speak, to kind of, you know, end up, uh, you know, trying to find a way, but then ended up ending up uh, much loss or more loss than, than ever and stuff. Yeah. Another key difference, I would say, between Lone Wolf and Road to Perdition mm -hmm. is um, is this idea of the father with with the father and the son is that Sullivan is actually deceiving his kids um, and his wife mm -hmm. to some degree, whereas Ito is unapologetically exposing his mm -hmm. kid to everything that he does. Yeah, and so I think that's in Lone Wolf and Cub. I actually find that a more compelling uh, theme. Than mm. the you know the the father trying to hide the sins of his mm. of his kind of job, um, but it's another sort of key difference I think when you're looking at them. And I mean, I, I was reading apparently you know he got influenced by quite a few different things other than Lone Wolf. I think he just mm -hmm. made a bit more, more more of a deal of it. I mean, there's a couple of Don Siegel. There's a Don Siegel movie called Charlie Barrick, which where mm. he, that's where he got the idea for robbing uh, the banks that were kind of controlled by the mob to get the oh, money. Okay. And um, there's, I think there's another one, John Borman's Point Blank from 67, where he also you know, has a similar sort of idea of, mm. you know, you get your revenge by robbing the, uh, the money lines of the mob, which is, which is pretty cool. And actually it's quite down, downplayed in this. And this almost becomes like right. kind of a fun little side thing with the kid yeah, learning yeah. to drive and stuff. But yeah. it's kind of cool. But... Yeah, and, and I think it's um, funny how the gangster, you know, um, genre, so to speak, in some ways, like kind of was just kind of parallel, like kind of Westerns and stuff. And we, we saw that like in, you know, certainly this movie and stuff, but also I think in general, um, you know, throughout like kind of, I think around, I'd say the sixties or thereabouts that like, uh, for some reason they, they really just caught on just almost like a, I, I don't know, it, it, it's, they didn't replace Westerns, but they just definitely like kind of um, really kind of went side by side with them. And which I think, you know, kind of, is uh, of course a great um, connection to our last of the uh, group of this discussion, the Mandalorian, which yeah. like kind of just takes from this combination of, of the different things we've talked about and stuff. And uh, I think, you know, going back to our original discussion, they did it in such a way that um, really just brings a lot to the conversation. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think this has, it, it's funny because this does circle back to some of the the real key elements in that you've got again this very sort of innocent can't even talk baby yoda mm. that's being that's sort of witnessing all this violence and stuff it's not quite as effective as a point as lone, lone wolf and cub because the violence is tv friendly and not as extreme right, right. as and you know we haven't seen any kind of um intergalactic or... prostitutes or oh. anything like that yet so <laughs> right. so i mean and i don't and i doubt we're gonna ever see anything like no, that on no. the show but but I think what the, so, I mean, that's definitely the, um, one of the, the, the key similarities. Um, 
and it, it makes you you do watch it and like lone wolf you wonder how much is this kid yearning for normalcy in a normal mm. life because that's represented very much with Daigoro in lone wolf and cowboy you see him sort of go to the puppet show go mm. to the candy guy and then he gets he loses his dad and someone tries to kidnap him and stuff and he has he's right. back into the 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 demon way again and i and i kind of feel like that might be something it's still early days with the mandalorian but they've kind of mm-hmm. um hinted at that a little bit with the the one where they go to the village and they and they help mm. out the, the the villagers and mm. they realize that they're, they, they're going to keep sort of relentlessly searching for the kid but right. one of the interesting differences i think is one that it's not familial you know the mm. the bond between the mandalorian mm. and yoda has to be built up through their experience not right. it doesn't rely on that familial connection so there's going to have to be a lot of interaction where uh baby yoda saves the mandalorian like he did with the um the rhino thing and mm. and t- i mean the way i think they're going to exploit that interrelationship is by mm. making baby yoda suffer so the next oh. two or three seasons, I think you're going to see Baby Yoda suffering a hell of a lot more because that's going to because he's going to have to sacrifice himself for the Mandalorian hmm. to strengthen that relationship. Hmm. They're going to have to build that relationship in somehow because if you don't, it's yeah, the the drama is not going to go anywhere <laughs> with them. Then you're not going to um, you you need to feel like just as uh, Daigoro yearns for normalcy, Yoda's Baby Yoda is going to need to sort of um protect and and care for the mandalorian just as the mandalorian cares for him um which then i would say that's the other interesting twist for me is like for me like the you've got two uh strangers more or less who have been thrown into this position where they had to care for each other mm-hmm. and the force is often like i mean I, I feel that's like an analogy for um altruism and mm. kind of community um, general goodwill, essentially, um, and of course the you know the nice thing about a new hope, a new hope for you know an, an era of individualism <laughs> is that it 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 kind of means that if you're altruistic and care for other people, you get mm. superpowers in the Star Wars universe, <laughs> which is a great right. bonus. You know, if only when you went to church, you could fly and do things like this, right. there'd be a lot more people going to church, right? So, so I, I'm, and I, I think if they if they really use that as a as a key thing to exploit in the Mandalorian, it could really be a com, you know a compelling series. This idea of you know these two strangers who have a, who sort of create a sort of compassionate bond through altruism that shouldn't really have any kind of relationship would be a really mm. interesting, it, it could, it could be in, very interesting, but I would say overall it has a much more simplified feel. It feels like a Western mm. because the morality is very right. simplified. There's right. no real gray area or complexity. Yeah. So it has much, it feels much more like a Western than it does a samurai movie because it doesn't right. it, it, it hints at honor and codes with, with, with the bounty hunters but it's not really you know no, no one really cares about that you know? so yeah it, it's funny how that's almost like um you know relegated to kind of more like those of us who are more diehard fans so to speak that like we care more about like kind of this culture of the mandalorians and stuff and like you know like you said that the you know like kind of uh complicated issues of honor and that kind of thing like you know to to the average viewer it's more about it's all about baby yoda <laughs> it's, yeah, it's all absolutely. about like kind of you know, the, the, the cute factor and kind of how ooh wow cool you know baby yoda has like these powers and stuff and, and it's um I, I think that's like like you said that the simplicity of the story uh is very much like kind of you know what makes westerns work different times and i think you know like that's that's the appeal and how um i think What's what's kind of um, funny also along with like the lines of the the, the fact that like the, the bond is not familial is the fact that like um, it's it, there's also like you know the only kind of hint of like a a, a female uh, relationship you know like kind of with with the celibate Mandalorian right was like kind of this um, other assassin that kind of fought side by side and stuff so I think it's interesting how we're in some ways going back to this idea that, um, or, or this universe that George Lucas created, where like, yeah. you know, any kind of love is like very innocent and stuff. And, and it's like kind of, there's none of the, you know, um, lust kind of idea that like, you know, in some ways, maybe, um, you know, Empire Strikes Back is almost like kind of 
shifted things more in that direction and then like oh but we reined it back and, and returned the jedi back to a kind of very innocent kind of you know let's all dance together kind of world absolutely yeah yeah it's just sort of monks looking after people and yeah you're right you're right absolutely empires it, it's very much the standout because of the romance between right uh, han and leia yeah yeah you're right the lack of any kind of sort of mother figure for for the uh, for baby yoda is is pretty mm. interesting um yeah, yeah I mean, again that, that's in itself a, a um interesting kind of combat though that like we're um, you know, we, we see like, you know, in each of these, like it's centered around the father son relationship and stuff, which definitely kind of, you know, besides the, the obvious, like kind of, it's a male kind of oriented kind of thing and stuff, but it's interesting how, I don't know, like, um, that in all these cases, you know, like kind of the, the, the mother is kind of killed off, like kind of, or in this case, you know, it's not even, you know, visible at all. Like, kind of, you know, we have no idea who was his mother of baby Yoda and stuff, you know, or was yeah. it just maybe like an immaculate kind of birth, I guess. A convergence of metachlorians, I think is the <laughs> right, technical right. term you're looking for there. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think uh, it, it's, yeah. Also, yeah, I mean, you're right. There's no, there's no kind of familial tie. Hopefully, you know, maybe we'll find out something like that. It's still early days with the, with the series, maybe something interesting will happen there. <laughs> um, but, also, you know, the, the other thing that the, the, the difference for me is that there's no real point for the revenge for the Mandalorian to take mm -hmm. revenge on people. You know, there's not right, this right. sort of heavy revenge yeah. plot like there is. He's just out there trying to sort of, survive. he's a very kind of, out, yeah, survive basically. And yeah. in that respect, he has, it has more of a feel of like a drifter who's mm -hmm. just trying to sort of survive in the, in, so again, it, it draws more on Westerns, I think than sort right. of some grand dramatic revenge plot like some of the other things we've been looking at. Yeah, and I, th I thought that the, um, it's interesting how we kind of go back, you know, certainly part of, you know, The Mandalorian is the fact that like it, it's a uh, episodic structure. So then very much like you, we would kind of have this story unfold through, you know, kind of these chapters that like, you know, um, this chapter leads to that one, that leads to that one and stuff. And then so of course, season one, you know, is just concluded, just leading to season two that we're kind of like, is only kind of hinted at as the kind of things we'll see, uh, because like the, one of the last, you know, ma major spoiler, one of the last things is the fact that like now he he's off on this quest to find like kind of, I guess, the, um, you know, the home, I guess, for, for, you know, where Baby Yoda belongs and stuff. Yeah. I mean, if, if we can, I mean, if we can draw from what these are influenced by mm. we can maybe draw some potential outcomes of what will happen in the <laughs> mandalorian so uh, almost certainly i would say the mandalorian's going to die at the end of the seasons you know huh. that, that's that's without question we're getting a sullivan style ending there i think right will we see spinning lightsabers coming out of the side of the baby <laughs> pod oh, no. and 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 sort of cutting people down <laughs> i don't know that would be kind of cool but um, <laughs> And maybe like some blasters that are integrated into the front of it. That would be, uh, <laughs> that was one thing I have to say with the Lone Wolf and Cub. He seemed to have endless amounts of ammo. Uh, <laughs> you probably haven't seen, I don't think you saw in movie six, but in that one, he's just more or less got like a submachine gun fitted into that baby car. It's pretty incredible. But um, yeah, this so, definitely yeah. is one of those iconic things that like he's just able to kind of pull things out of like, you know, like seemingly thin air. <laughs> Yeah, there's uh, my favorite. I don't know if you've seen that one yet, but there's one where there's, there's cannon fire and there's metal shields <laughs> that get pulled out, out of the baby car. <laughs> and I was like thinking, so this car floats on water. It's got, <laughs> it's packed with machine guns and knives, has bomb proof shielding. You know, it's, it's, I don't know, unless he constructed it as he went, you know, it's a bit yeah. of a difficult one to go through. I, I had to like think that like, you know, I can always imagine like kind of the, the Japanese writers and like just the, the sheer glee that they had to have to come up with some of these like kind of, um, you know, ideas for like how to like kind of, you know, like you said, use the card or like kind of have these different weapons that kind of, you know, like, um, I, I mean, it, it's to me like it, it's another way that like they take this uh, samurai genre to like this level of like beyond even extreme it's like kind of just it's it's its own kind of um universe i guess you know like kind of it's it's like the the lone wolf version of of the samurai universe and stuff yeah yeah um 
so yeah, I'm trying to think what else um, we would see definitely, <laughs> in, you know, happening. Um, I mean, if there is a, what might be interesting is they might sort of have some sort of mirroring of what you saw, like in Road, Road to Perdition, you've got mm. almost like a father son relationship. You might, you might find out that um, the bad guy with his dark saber is somehow like either the father or the son of someone right. who's either a bigger boss or has someone else or something like that. It might be something interesting there that they do. Um, Anything. I'm sure I wrote down some other possibilities of where this thing might go. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, having uh, the you know the the uh, guy Gus uh, Spring or uh, Gus Spring rather from Breaking Bad, like like when he showed up as the the, the big boss, I, I was like kind of like whoa, that was that, 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 I think you know they definitely knew their audience, like um, <laughs> <laughs> you know to bring TV him binges. In. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, TV like, right. binge <laughs> audience definitely. Yeah, no, I mean that was that was that was a nice surprise. Um, the other thing I think will, that will happen is mm. um, uh, both. There's no hint in Lone Wolf and Cub mm. that uh, Daigaro is ever going to end up as a samurai or a warrior. Mm. And uh, likewise, in Road to Perdition, Michael doesn't seem like he's going to ever become related in anything violent. If anything. Yeah. He seems to be, you know, there's this thing hinted that he reads the Bible stories, like he's probably mm. might even go into the church or something like that. Right. And I and I and it's some this part of you that kind of feels like there's the action kind of mindset that says, Oh yeah, maybe baby Yoda could kind of spin out of the cart and he'll be like, you know, <laughs> but but I don't I think if they've got any kind of if they to make the series more interesting, mm. they'll probably have him not being a warrior mm. and kind of providing some sort of being influential with the force, but not in, but not in any kind of sort of combative way. Mm. So. Yeah, I mean, that'll be interesting, like I said, to see, you know, where they're going with, you know, Baby Yoda himself or something like that. And, um, and, and yeah, I mean, that's, you know, like kind of like you said, it's in some ways, if it's any reflection on these others, um, then yeah, it's very much makes sense that like part of the idea is to, that he, he is an innocent and therefore like, uh, you know, to do these kind of things and stuff, um, you know, would just be where, I don't know, it, it's like almost defeats the purpose. Like in other words, um, it feels like the Mandalorian, besides protecting him, is also like, try, I guess that's that's another kind of um, thing that's both a parallel, but also different from the series. Um, because like you pointed out in, in the, um, the original Lone Wolf, he's very much, you know, opening up his son to this world and it's questionable as to which direction he's going to go. But then in Rose Perdition, it's very much like that uh, Tom Hanks character is trying to protect his son and, and like trying, you know, trying to, in fact, his death like kind of is a, um, almost like a statement for him to like, you know, don't go this way and stuff. And, and Absolutely. Uh, yeah. 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 I'm sure they'll do something similar. I think as well, you're going to see much like Lone Wolf and Cub, there's bits where the, the Daigo is uh, more isolated and I'm sure you're going to mm. see that in season two where baby Yoda is more isolated and he's, you know, it's, it's sort of tug on your heartstrings or like the lost baby Yoda who's <laughs> out there somewhere and they're desperately trying to find him or something rather than him being kidnapped, it will be him getting lost, mm. which is one of the episodes from Lone Wolf and Cub. Um, I think as well, there'll be some more complexity because, mm. um, there's one of the, the one of my favorite ones of the, of the Lone Wolf and Cub series mm -hmm. is the one where the the ruler has a, a legitimate son mm -hmm. with a wife that he doesn't love or has maybe mm -hmm. killed off. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And he's hidden him away in a castle, and mm -hmm. his new mistress has got another daughter. And oh. The daughter is being sort of positioned as a as a boy, but that's the secret. Oh. And uh, and um, you know, it's it's about all this sort of intrigue of that. So mm -hmm. you might get something more complex happening this season, who knows? But <laughs> I think as well, what they'll probably do is, um, I think they'll do it very cleverly, but I think it will go darker. Mm. And I think there are, there are ways in which you can make something that's sort of aimed at a fairly young audience or mm -hmm. a TV kind of friendly audience, but still do it in a dark way. Like one of, one of the cleverest um, storylines I can think of of something that's basically sort of aimed at, teenagers was um one piece where they had the um it's basically an the, the they go to a, a land where it is inhabited by people and toys like mm. sort of sentient toys mm. and um 
and you think, oh, this is kind of like a weird, quirky place mm -hmm. until you realize that all the toys um, are people who've tried to rise up against the government and have Whoa. been turned into these sort of toys who, are com right. who have no, who have their, com you know, they can't actually, they can't speak. I think mm -hmm. that's it. Or they just sort of follow people around. So basically mm -hmm. like, you know, they're conscious, but they're trapped in these bodies. Right. Of toys. So it's, it's actually a very kind of dark and quite twisted yeah. story, oh, yeah. but, but it's kind of framed in a very much kind of uh, TV kid friendly way. So I'm, I'm, I think if they're clever, they'll do something like that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, you, you probably hit the nail on the head because of how, you know, bringing somebody like Giancarlo Esposito is really, to me, like a sign that like, you know, mm. they're willing to kind of go somewhere darker because, you know, he's not, he's not just a um, cartoonish kind of uh, villain. He's very much like, kind of, you know, like, um, you know, like the, the things that like happen, you know, like a, a side spoiler, I guess, for the Breaking Bad, but, like kind of where, um, you know, the, the darkness that he brings is, is like kind of... It, it, a one that like definitely involves intrigue like kind of that's to me like kind of what he symbolizes different times where um he you know like will have like this kind of agenda of like being very kind of polite and uh almost in some ways you know going back to road tradition where you know the the connor character um that paul newman plays has this kind of front of like kind of you know like you know smooth sophistication kind of you know gentleness if you will but you know it really like hides this kind of devious, you know, plotting, uh, you know, villain stuff. I mean, beyond, yeah, to be honest with you, when I saw them introducing him as the bad guy, I was mm. even surprised they had him with a black cape wielding right, a right, lightsaber right, because I thought, right. you know, they may want to, you know, spin it more <laughs> in the in the Breaking Bad sort of mold, but I guess they've, they've already outed him as the, as the main bad guy. Yeah, so. I, I think it's, it's like, it's, that choice to me is like probably a statement of like how, um, they kind of know people's reaction is going to be the minute that he shows up and stuff like, you know, they're, they're, they're like, it's almost like we're, um, they probably didn't see a point to hiding it. <laughs> like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I get, I get what you're saying. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, that's the thing as well. It's like audiences evolve as well and mm. know to guess. Right, and this right. actually, it sort of brings me on something which I'm going to, I'm going to sort of explore a little bit more in some of our upcoming remakes or something that occurred to me was this idea that, why do you often see the same actors playing the same roles mm. over and over again or being yeah. typecast? And I've noticed when we've been looking at movies from the 30s and the 40s and 50s, mm -hmm. the difference in the script and the dialogue and the character development is, is you know, miles away from what it is these days. We right. don't put anywhere much as, we're not prepared to sit through characters interacting for 20 mm. minutes and to, to establish that character. Right. And so things like action movies in the 80s meant that you know, we wanted the action. We don't necessarily need to, we're not interested in, or the film producers weren't interested in, in building those characters there because they right. wanted to make the, the pyrotechnics speak instead. And I think if that choice is where we let, what that led us to this thing of people being typecast because mm. in real life, you've already established who that actor mm. is as a character right. so that's why Ar arnie always plays the same character because mm -hmm. you don't you don't it's, it's less work for the script writers mm. they can have like an entire movie made of action scenes because you already know who who arnie is right. likewise tom cruise you already kind of know who he is um so i'm sure that is what's led to you know the the, the present state where actors just like do one right. thing and it's this leads us back to road to perdition one thing we've talked about is tom <laughs> hanks as a mob hitman oh, i just right. i mean because the thing is i remember what i remember watching this like mm -hmm. when it came out and i mm -hmm. thought to myself i'm just not buying this really that tom mm -hmm. hanks is a hitman right and even and even now i was like i thought wow he really looks like he's trying <laughs> but i just don't buy that he's like this guy who's killed dozens of people for the mob it just i think for me the reason why it works is the fact that like I see him more as this family man who ends up being a hitman rather than the other way around where it would be harder for me to buy a character who's a assassin trying to be a family man and stuff. So mm -hmm. for me, that's why his role works in this particular case. I think in most cases, like you said, yeah, I would have totally like, you know, like what the heck are they thinking? Like Tom Hanks is a gangster. It's like, it could easily be parody, but I think because mm. of the context of the story that that works and stuff. And for me personally and stuff. And also I think, you know, the other part for me is that like, I, I like seeing him or I, I really, you know, like kind of bought him and enjoyed seeing him as, you know, Captain Miller on Saving Private Ryan. I, and also like even, 
in um, the other one where he's a captain that like uh, is basically trying to stay alive with like kind of these um, the Somali gangsters and stuff like that. So for me, like I buy him as an action character because I've seen him in these. So so like you said about like kind of you know, di um, different times, um, what works is the seeing these characters or these actors in these certain kind of characters and stuff. Because I, if I hadn't seen him in the, those kind of roles, it's kind of like, um, to me, how, you know, like more recently, right, uh, the actor who played Jim on The Office is now suddenly Jack Ryan. But mm, I think yeah. because I saw him in um, the other movie, uh, 12, um, I forget the name of it now, uh, but it's the one about the Navy SEALs and stuff like that. But because I saw him in this other role, that then mm. it, I, I could buy it. I think it's like, to me, like almost... Um, be, besides like kind of the, the idea of like uh, you know typecast whatever it, it's just also this idea that like if we see them in the role that then we buy it that like in other words yeah. if I had seen them in these other roles I don't think I would have bought Tom Hanks like you said as, as this you know gangster father and stuff yeah it's, it's a very sort of odd state of affairs because you can't as an actor I don't think actually look at that your role on a film by film basis, you have to look mm. at your entire career and say, okay, right. I'm this character, or I'm going to be these characters. And I have to sort of build up to these in various <laughs> stages in a way to, to set your audience up because there isn't that mm. dialogue or, or setting up within the films themselves. Right. Um, yeah, I, yep. I don't know. I mean, I just, for me, I can, I can accept Tom Hanks as a reluctant <laughs> killer, as okay. someone who's survived, but I mean, as a mob, enforcer <laughs> you're gonna you've got to be pretty damn evil and i just don't i don't i don't buy that even as a family man you'd, you'd still be pretty evil as a mob I, enforcer and i just don't buy i bought daniel I, craig and jude law they did it right, effortlessly right right but um not I, tom hanks I, I think it's because of how like in these other roles even that like it's more about tom hanks as this professional something that like he's 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 like he's a Every man that's able to be a professional, I think it's, it's just more that aspect of his qual or, or his um, characters uh, that, that like, yeah. I think, you know, came through for me. And, and I think for me, like him as an enforcer, it's more about the fact that like, I can see him as a family man who was a professional that like, you know, just happened to be a enforcer stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, you're, yeah, you're giving a lot more... Uh... <laughs> suspension of disbelief than i am right. i didn't I, di I didn't really buy him as the professor in da vinci code though so you know i'm i'm very heretical in that respect i don't think tom <laughs> hanks is like can pull off every single role under the sun right right we'll do but yeah well um in in terms of movies coming up and stuff um i thought yes. that uh we've got uh thomas crown affair is like one that uh i've been kind of interested in kind of looking at again and stuff another one is um always and uh a man that Nate Joe is the, kind of the original for that one. Um, so those are probably a couple of others that like, I think we'll, we'll kind of see which one uh, strikes our uh, fancy, I guess, so to speak. Uh, and then of course, if we want to re return to more pandemic kind of a uh, uh, discussion, uh, that we've still got Andromeda Strain as like kind of another one that, uh, in, in that series of stuff. So um, any anything that kind of really catches your attention that? Uh, mm remakes and things nothing much really to be honest on the, on the horizon i'm just happy to uh go through i am i am i haven't say though i really enjoyed watching lone wolf and cub and i would quite happily watch some more of kenji misumi's movies mm. or maybe some akira kurosawa so uh we could do seven samurai as well that's another one yeah that's true that's one of my i, I probably need a good amount of time to give that due thought and attention right. there but uh, yeah yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I think, you know, we can definitely do a, a few just with that of, 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 you know, like kind of based on Kira Kurosawa because he's done a few that has not only inspired other, um, you know, remakes or, or not even so much remakes, but other films, uh, you know, because certainly a lot of key filmmakers have talked about him as being like a source of inspiration. But likewise, uh, what's interesting, I think, is that his films different times are also, um, you know, drawing from different genres like westerns and uh you know very much like kind of so it's kind of this kind of uh art imitating life imitating art kind of thing that seems to happen as well yeah yeah absolutely awesome so once again uh, thanks for watching and uh i'm john chang with dan Edmonds, and uh we'll catch you at the movies <laughs>